temos o prazer de apresentar a professora Mary Buckles. She is a social cultural linguist with a strong commitment to interdisciplinarity and identity studies. In addition to her position in the University of California, Department of Linguistics, she is also affiliated with the Department of Anthropology, the Department of Feminist Studies, the Department of Spanish and Portuguese, the Gewürz Graduate School of Education, the Comparative Literature Program, and the Latin America and Iberian Studies Program. Sua pesquisa está centrada principalmente em como as identidades sociais e as práticas culturais são construídas pela interação linguística. She has investigated this question in relation to race, gender, youth identities, and also with the context of how undergraduate science and math students become socialized into scientific cultures through peer interaction. Además de eso, su investigación actual busca explorar las diversas formas de lenguaje y cultura en California, especialmente en colaboración con estudiantes de posgrado y pregrado, así como jóvenes y compañeros educativos en el área de Santa Bárbara. Bienvenida, estimada profesora. Bienvenida, profesora. Welcome, professor. Thank you for that introduction. Bon dia, buenos dias, y gracias por estar aquí. Lo primero de todo, me gustaría disculparme por antema, de antemano por dar esta presentación hoy en inglés, en lugar de en español o portugués. Soy consciente de que el privilegio que tengo como hablante nativa de inglés es uno de los muchos ejemplos de hegemonía que nosotros como lingüistas aplicadas y aplicados tenemos que desmantelar y estoy trabajando duro para ser capaz de dar una presentación completamente en español. I'd also like to thank Rodrigo Borpa and the entire organizing committee for the honor of this invitation and for their generous hospitality under impossible circumstances. Finally, I want to express my support and solidarity with the people of Brazil in the important work you're doing to resist social, political, and economic injustice in your country. Your commitment and resolve are an inspiration to those of us from the United States. Thanks. Thank you. I would like to begin by acknowledging my collaborators at UC Santa Barbara, Ines Casillas and Jin Suk Lee, who I've been working with for the past several years on the project that I'll be discussing today. So just to orient you to where I want to go this morning, I'll begin by providing some political and theoretical background for the issues that I'll be addressing. I'll then focus on the research context, a special program for youth that my collaborators and I have been working on for several years. And I'll use this context to offer four different instances of how we as linguists might work toward what I'm calling sociolinguistic justice with racialized youth. Um, and then I'll offer a few brief final thoughts. And I didn't realize that uh, Isla has a tradition of not taking questions during or after the plenary talks, and so um, I'll try to reserve some time at the end so that people can come up uh, unofficially and we can have a, a conversation if you have questions or comments afterward, because I think that's a very important part of uh, what this event allows us to do together. So to begin, uh, this first part of the talk will set the scene by briefly describing some aspects of the U.S. political context uh, regarding race, race, language, and education. I'll also be offering a bit of an advertisement for various research that I think is especially valuable for thinking about this issue. Um, and I'll make the slides available on my website uh, within 24 hours of this talk so that you can get the references if you'd like them. So I'd like to start with a very useful paper by Julio Camarotto and Michelle Aguilera 
uh, that focuses on the notorious legalization of racism against Latinas and Latinos in the state of Arizona in the United States. The author's title, By the Time I Get to Arizona, as well as the idea of Arizona as a racist state, borrows from a song by the rap group uh, Public Enemy, which is very apt in this context. You may know the song. Uh, so some of these laws include a ban on bilingual education in the year 2000, a 2010 ban on Chicano studies classes in public schools, uh, despite the proven success of these classes in supporting students academically, um, and this ban was put in place on the grounds that such classes, quote, promote the overthrow of the United States government and teach students to, quote, resent or hate other races and classes of people. Also in 2010, uh, Arizona legalized the racial profiling of anyone suspected of being an unauthorized immigrant. Uh, and most of these laws are still in effect in some form. So I'm starting with Arizona not because it's uniquely egregious in its racism, but because it isn't. In particular, my own state of California is also a racist state, and it has also enacted a series of racist laws in the past several decades. And so to illustrate this point, I'm displaying not images of racism within the state, which are plentiful, but rather images that put the focus where it should be on activism and action that challenges racism. It's also important to point out that all the racist laws I'll talk about were passed not by legislators, but by the voters of California in popular referenda. The first of these is Proposition 63, which amended the California Constitution to make English the official language of the state. This law is still in effect, and it was the first in a wave of xenophobic official English laws that were enacted beginning in the 1980s, and this wave is still ongoing. Um, and the blue uh, states that are indicated here are laws that have official, language on, uh, official English language laws on the books, sometimes in addition to other languages, but mostly not. Most of these are xenophobic laws that were passed after California passed its law. Less than a decade later, California voters passed Proposition 187, the openly xenophobic so-called Save Our State initiative, which banned unauthorized immigrants from accessing basic and essential public services, including health care and education. Although it faced immediate legal challenges, it was not ruled unconstitutional until 1997, and it was not officially repealed until 2014. Nevertheless, only two years later, the mindset that gave rise to Proposition 187 made affirmative action, which I think in some other contexts is called positive discrimination. Um, so it made that uh, kind of policy illegal in the state of California, specifically in public employment and education. The effect of the student population uh, of the University of California system, where I got my PhD and where I now teach, was immediate. A year after the law took effect, uh, which was also the year I graduated, um, the admission of black, Chicano, and Latino, and Native American students plummeted, as you can see in the graph. And this is a pattern that continues today, because again, this law remains in effect. Finally, as part of the same flurry of anti-Latina and Latino laws passed in the 1990s in California, in 1998, Proposition 227 banned nearly all bilingual education programs within the state replacing it with a single year of structured English immersion. Uh, Ron Unz, pictured here, um, co-opting a Latino youth for his own purposes, uh, is the conservative businessman who funded this campaign. Uh, and he went on to fund similar initiatives in several other states, including Arizona. So California was arguably the first racist state in creating these kinds of laws. However, thanks to demographic and political shifts in California, Proposition 227 was overwhelmingly rejected by voters last fall. And I'll say a little bit more about that in just a minute. But even before the state of California passed Proposition 227, my own city, Santa Barbara, rushed to pass an even more extreme anti-Latina and Latino law. In an incident that made national news five months before the statewide vote, Santa Barbara's all-white school board unanimously voted to immediately eliminate bilingual education in the middle of the academic year. 
English learners, most of them Latina and Latino, were placed in so-called mainstream classes with minimal support. As one school board member stated in a news story reported by the New York Times, white parents, quote, don't want their kids to go to a school where half the kids speak Spanish. People want their children to have a happy, open learning experience. And incidentally, this guy now teaches at UC Santa Barbara. He is, um, I guess, officially one of my colleagues. Uh, in a response to the school board's action, bilingual education advocates in Santa Barbara created a dual immersion bilingual elementary school, which is pictured here. It's actually just a, a collection of temporary buildings. Uh, thanks to Proposition 58, though, such schools may become more common and better funded. They're not perfect, uh, but as research abundantly demonstrates, they're vastly superior to English-only education. But the legacy of Proposition 227 has affected an entire generation of California's Latina and Latino students who have been forced to undergo their entire education in English only. And those are the students I'll be talking about today. Uh, but before I get there, I want to kind of talk about the theoretical framing of this talk. So these histories of struggle around race and language make it clear that social justice needs to be a central concern for us as applied linguists. Many people in the field and in this room have led the way in focusing on the relationship between language and social justice. Yet despite these important contributions, there's less engagement with the concept of social justice in linguistics than in many other disciplines, at least in the, U oh my gosh. <laughs> at least in the US context that I'm most familiar with. Uh, so we have a lot of work ahead. Obviously, Brazil is way ahead of us here, thanks to Laura Paulo Freire and other politically engaged educators. And here I highlight just three recent volumes that are helpful for considering the role of social justice in applied linguistics and vice versa. I think we have things to teach uh, the social justice movement and social justice theory. So just to be clear, when I talk about social justice, what I mean is the struggle for self-determination for socio-politically subordinated groups and individuals through the redistribution of power and resources. And this is my own understanding of what social justice is. It may not align with some of the dominant perspectives. In particular, the way I think about social justice is not simply as a synonym for rights. Uh, to create a somewhat artificial binary, a rights view, tends to be top-down, universalizing in its scope, governmental and institutional in orientation, representative and global in its democratic forms, and policy-based in the solutions it offers. Meanwhile, social justice, for me, is bottom-up, particularizing in its scope, grassroots and collective in orientation, participatory and local in its democratic forms, and practice-based in the solutions it offers. We obviously need both kinds of approaches, uh, but social justice is where I see the greatest hope for transformative systematic change. Um, and when I say that social justice is a struggle, not a state, um, that's also the case for uh, sociolinguistic justice. Um, so given the importance of language and processes of social inequity, such as the racist laws that I've discussed, Achieving social justice also necessarily involves working towards sociolinguistic justice. In a couple of publications, one of which, the book from which it comes, is pictured here, my co-authors and I define this concept as self-determination for linguistically subordinated individuals and groups in socio-political struggles over language, so kind of paralleling the social justice definition I just offered. We've formulated a set of goals for sociolinguistic justice, although we recognize that inevitably these will be understood and taken up differently by different individuals and communities. It's not for linguists to decide how to enact sociolinguistic justice, it's for communities and uh, their members to do so. So the first set of goals um, focuses on what I'm going to be calling linguistic diversity. Oh dear. I think I touched something and now we have a terrible buzz. Sorry, we're just having audio challenges this morning. Um, so, we'll get through this. Uh, so the first set of goals of sociolinguistic justice focus on linguistic diversity and equity. Um, the first of these is uh, what my colleagues and I are calling uh, linguistic valorization, uh, which focuses on fostering awareness and appreciation of linguistic diversity and variation. Uh, linguistic legitimation, uh, which emphasizes the validity of speakers' linguistic repertoires across social spheres. 
linguistic inheritance, um, which emphasizes learning and learning about one's own languages, dialects, and styles. And again, these are contested issues, and different members of communities are going to understand linguistic ownership differently. That's, again, not something for linguists to arbitrate. That's something uh, that communities will work out for themselves, and linguists can uh, help in that process. The second set of goals for sociolinguistic justice focus on issues of power and authority, uh, and these include linguistic access, um, so the importance of learning and learning about powerful languages, dialects, and styles, so people need to have access to the language of power as long as that's something that matters in societies. Uh, linguistic expertise, so the rec recognition of all language users as linguistic experts, um, and finally, and most importantly, a critical understanding of language inequality and language ideologies, um, where uh, this fosters the opportunity to scrutinize structures and belief systems that reproduce oppression. And this last item is crucial because it really underpins all the others, and understanding the social basis of language inequality is necessary to challenging it. Sociolinguistic justice covers a lot of social issues, but it's almost always closely tied to race. So I wanted to just lay out some of the fundamental assumptions that I bring to the study of language and race. And uh, some of these issues were discussed in yesterday's symposium on sociolinguistic approaches to language and identity that I think some of the folks in the room uh, attended. So first of all, all human beings are positioned within systems and processes of racialization. No one gets to opt out of race. Second, race is a social construct for claiming power and resources, and therefore it must be continually reproduced both materially and discursively. Third, race and language are semiotically entangled and jointly produced. And this last point has been beautifully theorized in some recent work that I want to talk about now. So here I'm drawing heavily on Jonathan Rosa and Nelson Flores' concept of a raciolinguistic perspective which they also spoke about yesterday. Um, and these are two of the most important theorists of race and language working in the US today and arguably in the world. Um, and so here's what they mean by raciolinguistic ideologies. Uh, they say, quote, uh, the ideological construction and value of standardized language practices are anchored in what we term raciolinguistic ideologies that conflate certain racialized bodies with linguistic deficiency unrelated to any objective linguistic practices. So just describing linguistic practices, as they point out, is not enough uh, to address racism because race uh, underlies all of the ways that uh, people perceive racialized speakers. Um, and they spelled this out in a 2015 article as well as in a forthcoming article that I hope you'll all consult in the fall in Language and Society. Uh, so by this point, uh, many of the audience members Every time I touch this, something bad happens over there. Okay. Um, by this point, many of the audience members, especially scholars and students of color, may be wary of this talk, given my visible and audible subject position as an upper middle class, white, English dominant US citizen. And of course, you're right to be skeptical. Uh, but there are a lot of white people in our field, and we can't just avoid our responsibility to address race, even though that might be more comfortable for us. So the goal needs to be to put us to work but to recognize that we don't really know what we're doing and we have a lot to learn. So here are some guiding principles for the white identified people in the room in thinking critically about our racial subject positions. And you all know who you are. I'm talking to you now. Um, so first of all, whiteness is the foundation of the racial system and it is a construct for claiming and preserving power. Um, secondly and relatedly, uh, white identified scholars and educators have special responsibilities because of the privileges that we carry just by, basic, uh, by virtue of this racial structure. So first, the way we learn about race is by reading and listening and not by asking people of color to teach us they have other things to do. Uh, secondly, it is important for us to continually scrutinize our own whiteness and how it limits and distorts our perceptions and that is all the time in every way. Uh, third, we need to be open to critique, especially from people of color, um, and we can help each other as white people to notice these issues as well. And finally, we need to actively work to dismantle the hegemonic power of whiteness through our research and teaching. Just having good intentions isn't enough, we've got to fight. So finally, um, when we focus specifically on racialized youth, as I'm uh, going to be doing today, 
We need to think about our positionalities as researchers and educators, and this is true not just for white researchers and educators, but for everybody. So there are a number of discussions of decolonizing anti-racist, youth-centered pedagogical and methodological frameworks available. I highlight two of them here that I think are um, especially useful. Um, and again, much of this work is informed directly or indirectly by the ideas of Freire, so uh, we were very much in the debt uh, of um, his work. So I wanted to turn now to the context of my own research with racialized youth in California and in this program called SKILLS. So SKILLS is an acronym and kind of a problematic one based on the kind of conservative discourse of skills-based education and back to basics. Uh, that's not really what we meant. We were thinking more of kind of the hip hop skills thing when we came up with this acronym. Um, and also it, it works very well for the kind of uh, content, all the letters we had to get into the name. Uh, so it stands for School Kids Investigating Language in Life and Society. Um, and I direct the program currently. Ines Casillas and Jin Suk Lee are the associate directors. Jin Suk will be stepping in as the uh, director in the fall. Uh, Skills is a collaboration between UC Santa Barbara faculty, graduate students, and undergraduates, and schools and other youth-serving institutions in our local area. The Skills program is designed to combine teaching linguistics from a critical standpoint, youth research and activism on language, college preparation for students, graduate and undergraduate training in teaching and research, and community engagement. And incidentally, uh, this is a photo of the UCSB campus where I teach. It's beautiful, but not as beautiful as Rio. <gasps> oh. okay. Sorry, I really don't know why it does that. Okay. Goals of the skills program. Uh, so these, uh, the program has multiple goals. It's designed to benefit various groups. Um, most uh, importantly, of course, the students themselves. Uh, so first and foremost, we seek to foster sociolinguistic justice. And we aim to do that by positioning young people not just as knowledge consumers, uh, but as knowledge producers, linguistic and cultural experts, and agents of social change in their own right. We also seek to engage UCSB graduate and undergraduate students in local communities, not only as researchers, but also as teachers and mentors and friends. And we want to likewise engage family and community members, both as resources for youth language, um, for youth re research and activism on language, and as audiences for that work, as a way of raising awareness of language issues in our local community. Just to give you a sense of what the program looks like, we're trying very hard not to be school as usual. Um, although we don't often, we, we often don't succeed in that goal. There are a lot of challenges to that. Uh, but the focus is on what students already know and what they want to know and not on what we think they should know. So this is very much uh, driven by students' own interests and goals. So we take an inquiry-based approach focused on discussion and exploration. There are no tests, no traditional textbook, very little homework. What we do takes place almost entirely within the classroom, in addition to students' research in their homes and communities. The program focuses on students' own linguistic and cultural expertise and identities, and they use, it uses those as the basis for learning. The curriculum is explicitly critical in its focus, with close attention to issues of race and power and language. And this can lead to some tension with the students' teachers who are also in the classroom, uh, but it is, of course, the heart of the program and very productive to have those conversations. Uh, we emphasize communicating knowledge orally and in written form to real audiences, using students' existing and developing linguistic abilities, and whatever linguistic practices they feel are most important for their audiences and goals. Uh, we don't have a core curriculum. The program adapts to the needs of its partner site and the students every year. So one example of this flexibility is that since we started in 2010, Skills has served over 800 students who have ranged in age from 6 to 19. They've mostly been Latina and Latino, um, and mostly the children of Mexican immigrants. Uh, but we've also served other groups, including uh, Native Americans, specifically a California tribe that is near Santa Barbara, uh, indigenous Mexican immigrants, and smaller groups of white, Asian American, and African American students. We've worked in urban, suburban, and rural contexts. We've worked in college-level classes, in classes for students who are the first generation in their families to attend college, and in a high school for students who've been poorly served by traditional schooling, so-called at-risk students. 
We've taught skills as part of existing classes, as a standalone class, and as an after-school, summer, and weekend program. And we're usually able to offer it for college credit for free through collaborations with local colleges and universities. Last year, we offered the program to nearly 200 students in 11 classrooms from fifth graders to high school and community college levels. I should say we do this on a shoestring budget, and it's only because of the amazing generosity and energy of our graduate and undergraduate students that we're able to pull this off. The skills curriculum is five months long, uh, pretty intense, and varies based on the graduate teaching fellow's interests as well as those of each group of students. So the content differs across sites and from year to year. Some general, general topics that often appear in our curricula include youth linguistic innovation, including such phenomena as slang and translanguaging practices, language in the family, a topic that includes family language policy as well as language brokering, Language in power, which covers linguistic racism and language ideologies. Language variation, with a focus on varieties of Spanish and English, as well as other topics of particular interest to graduate and high school team members, including gender and sexuality, language documentation and revitalization, translation, language and music, the media, and others. At the beginning of the program, we bring youth to the UCSB campus for an orientation to the program and to receive information about getting and staying in college. They meet their colleagues at other partner sites and also get a taste of college life, including visiting classes, exploring the campus, and interacting with undergraduates who share their background as first-generation college-going youth, mostly themselves students of color. The student researcher activists return to UCSB at the end of the program to present their work to the campus community as well as to the general public. For many students, this is their first experience of public speaking and the first time they've ever been taken seriously as experts by adults. So it's often a transformative experience. They kind of can't get enough of it and they really want to get back up onto the po into the podium and in front of the microphone and uh, share their knowledge again and again. The impact of the program isn't limited to Skills Day presentations, though. Students' work is also showcased on the Skills website, along with all our curricular materials and our team research, including our publications. And the site is always in need of updating. So if there's something you don't see, just email me. And we're going to try to do a big overhaul this summer to make it easier for people to use. Uh, we have a big team because we have a lot of different roles to fill. Uh, so the heart of the team is the graduate teaching fellows who develop and implement curricula and provide linguistics content knowledge. Each site involves collaboration with a partner teacher, as I mentioned, who's experienced in educating young people and ideally provides pedagogical expertise, although sometimes that doesn't work out as we'd hoped. Um, also part of the team is a group of undergraduate mentors who act as teaching assistants and mentors in the classroom. Additional undergraduates serve as research assistants and interns who collect and process the student researcher activists' data as well as data of classroom interaction throughout the program. So we're doing research on the program as well as the students themselves doing research. Finally, the youth researcher activists carry out original projects and communicate the results to a variety of audiences in both spoken and written forms. And the goal of this structure is really for all team members to teach and learn from each other, and that really does turn out to work very well. Um, so some of, but not all of the examples that I'll be discussing today are taken from chapters by graduate students in a forthcoming volume that my collaborators and I have edited called Feeling It, Language, Race, and Affect in Latina and Latino Youth Learning. Um, so go talk to the folks at Routledge about that. I don't know what the status is right now, uh, but they might be able to place an advance order. Uh, so the book emerged from a project for which we received special interdisciplinary funding, and that project included a year-long seminar on language, race, and learning an undergraduate class on the same topic, and research and teaching on and in the skills program. Um, so the analyses I'm going to present today are often somewhat different in the direction from the original publication, so please do check out the actual papers that I mentioned. So I now want to turn to examples of the skills program in action and how our collaboration with racialized youth has helped us to think about how to achieve sociolinguistic justice and to move toward that goal in our work. So I want to focus on four ways that we, as applied linguists, can help advance sociolinguistic justice for racialized youth. And these are, first, by focusing on youth experiences of racialization through language and vice versa. 
Second, by recognizing the multiple forms of expertise of youth of color. Third, by understanding affect as central to language and race. And fourth, by approaching teaching and learning as a multidirectional partnership. So to, to illustrate my first point, the, so the first couple of examples I'm going to offer involve Taco Bell. Uh, if you don't know it, uh, it is a ubiquitous global fast food chain that purports to serve Mexican food. Um, and wherever you live, you're likely to have access to one or at least to have seen one somewhere. Uh, there are over 8,000 of them in over 33 countries and lots of them in Santa Barbara. Uh, so this one used to be my local Taco Bell, but it actually closed down. Uh, so I want to draw in particular here on Jonathan Rosa's powerful turn of phrase, looking like a language, sounding like a race. And this is the title of his forthcoming book. And it turns out that raciolinguistic ideologies are rampant at Taco Bell. So my first example comes from Adenari Zarate's chapter in the Feeling It volume. Adi was a skills teaching fellow, but in the example I'll show you, she was actually not the teacher um, leading this discussion. So in this example, uh, the skills teaching fellows have been leading a discussion of racial profiling in everyday life. Um, and a student who's usually very quiet, who Adenari calls Alberto, he's right here, um, speaks up and he talks about his own experience of, quote, looking like a language while working at a local Taco Bell. And this lo particular local Taco Bell serves an overwhelmingly white clientele. Uh, the Taco Bell, and some people would come in and I guess they took the safe route and speak Spanish. So I'll respond in Spanish. <laughs> so I think the graduate fellow here, Audrey, does a very clear job of pulling out the key analytic and political point of Alberto's brief narrative. Here, he, as a young Latino, resists being racialized as looking like a language by responding to his white customers in a language with a very different semiotic value in Santa Barbara. My second example comes from a collaboration between me and a student who was an undergraduate skills mentor at the time, Lisette Wences, uh, who is now a graduate student at Indiana University. Um, and this is Lisette presenting a poster on this research. Um, she also uh, presented at AAAL on this research as an undergraduate. So in this example, this is another skills classroom. Um, and it's actually an after-school program, so they're in the library, and that's why there's a couch that they're sitting on rather than uh, desks and so on. Um, so here they're discussing linguistic racism um, as they've confronted it in their lives. Uh, the speaker of interest here is actually in the background. She's in the upper left. Um, we're calling her Reina. And she's going to describe her experience of sounding like a race um, because of the way she places her order as a customer at a different Taco Bell in town. So these two examples illustrate in different ways how racialized youth critically engage with their own experiences of racio-linguistic ideologies. And this is a topic that they would otherwise never get to discuss in an academic setting in high school, as many of them have told us in expressing their appreciation for the program. So that's something we're doing right. The second way that we as scholars can advance sociolinguistic justice for racialized youth is to help them and others to recognize their many competencies that are often ignored or even actively disparaged, including linguistic expertise, cultural expertise, knowledge production, and sociopolitical agency. And I want to focus in particular here specifically on young people's linguistic expertise, which includes mastery of racialized and otherwise sociopolitically marginalized languages and varieties, translanguaging practices, which kind of moves us away from a code-based focus to a practice-based focus, uh, receptive bilingualism, and language brokering. And there's excellent work on all of these topics, and so I've got some book covers here for you to look for um, at the bookstore or your local library or the book exhibit. Um, and my next example is taken from our chapter in Django Paris and Samuel Eames' recently published edited volume, 
which provides a lot of really powerful examples of how to advance social justice for racialized youth, so I also recommend that to you. I told you it's going to be a lot of uh, advertising in this talk. Um, so this example uh, features a student researcher activist whom we call Isabel. And this example is taken from a presentation that Isabel gave at a special bilingual family night event at her school. And this was specifically to showcase students' work within the skills program to their families who often work one or more jobs that keep them from coming to the skills day event. So we're now adding skills night events um, to uh, open up the program to the families and communities. So this was the first of these events. Um, and the presenters were encouraged to use whatever languages, varieties, or styles they preferred. Uh, most students presented in Spanish, several presented in English. However, Isabel was the only student who chose to present her linguistic autobiography project through translanguaging, or what she called Spanglish, which is the way of speaking that she most closely associated with her own identity. So here she's talking about her use of Spanish versus English, English slang. Yo hablo a diferentes terms como con mi familia. Yo digo, ¿qué onda, chales? ¿Qué onda? <laughs> Yo puedo hablar con claro, mi mamá. Aquí, I'm like, battle, what's up then? <laughs> so in traditional schooling, there is no place for this young woman's linguistic and cultural expertise. In fact, it's not even recognizable as expertise. Uh, so Isabel moves easily from technical linguistic lexis, such as the term terms, uh, which she has learned in the skills class, to code switching to organize her discourse based on the context in which she uses Spanish versus English slang, at home versus at school, so con mi familia and aquí, at school. In addition, she engages in advanced translanguaging practices, such as yo habla versus Spanish yo hablo, as well as a phrase that may be her own creation, which seems to mean something like, I trash talk with my mom. While it's easy for educators and even linguists to hear Isabel as a bad speaker of Spanish, she's in fact a highly skilled speaker of California Spanglish. One of the skills teaching fellows who led the family night event, Sulema Carrubo Rogel, examined sp uh, parents' responses to the students' presentations in her chapter in the Feeling It volume. Um, and in this discussion, Isabel's mother said of her daughter, uh, in English, <laughs> this, she said it in Spanish, she doesn't know much Spanish, and the little bit that she knows is really choppy, mocho. Uh, I've told her many times, take Spanish classes, take Spanish. So this was kind of a hard moment for Isabel. We could see that in her embodied affect, and one of her classmates kind of patted her on the back reassuringly. Uh, Sulema, too, uh, felt that it would be a betrayal to Isabel and her other students to let this negative evaluation of translanguaging stand unchallenged, even though it came from somebody who loves Isabel very much. Uh, so she re politely responded to Isabel's mother by saying, one of the big focuses of the class is for the students to value their, the different languages that they speak, not only English and Spanish, but also the mixture, Spanglish, the mixing of Spanish and English. This is also a skill, because you're navigating two linguistic worlds at the same time. Thank you for recognizing it. So I thought that was a particularly skillful way of um, addressing the issue without uh, attacking uh, Isabella's mother. Um, so from this small but important intervention, it's clear that in working towards sociolinguistic justice for youth, we also need to invite real dialogue with family members about their children's linguistic experiences and practices, not to impose our perspective but to offer it along with students' own perspectives and family members' perspectives together. The third way that we as applied linguists can promote justice for racialized young people is to recognize the close connection between affect, language, and race. And what I mean by affect, this is sort of an unwieldy definition, I'm still working on it, um, is the simultaneously cognitive, perceptual, and emotional experience hyphen action, because I don't want to commit, of embodied material encounter with the world. Um, so uh, this is, uh, affect then is not a product of in individual minds, but an interactional and ideological negotiation somewhat similar to what Lorenza talked about uh, yesterday, this kind of achievement of intersubjectivity and expertise. Um, this is also the case with affect. It's not internal, it's public, social, and cultural. 
Um, a number of linguists have noticed the importance of affect language, um, including Aneta Pavlenko, and I hope I don't totally blow it here, uh, Kanavilil Hag, oh dear, uh, Hajagopalan, Hajagopalan? Kinda, that's okay, I'm so sorry. Uh, but anyway, his work is great, um, and he has a very useful quote here about this issue. An important part of the reason why we linguists have traditionally had little or no appreciable success in influencing public opinion with respect to language, let alone having a say in language planning and state policies, is that we have by and large tended to overlook or downplay the emotional aspect of language. And I think this is a really important message for us. Uh, we need to be thinking about how do we draw on that effect, affective component. Conversely, the relationship between race and affect has also begun to be explored in greater depth, as in Uleberg and Anna, uh, Anna Ramos Zayas' groundbreaking work on this issue, racializing affect. They write, racialization processes have been integral to, and at times constitutive of, the very conceptions of emotion, feeling, or sentiment that have historically produced, highlighted, and explained racial difference, and served to uphold dominant racial ideologies. Um, so this clearly resonates with the idea of raciolinguistic ideologies because when racialization works through language, it's also working through affect. So an example of how language, race, and affect converge comes from the Feeling It chapter by Katie Latif John, who's pictured here with a skills student. Uh, Katie is a specialist in translation studies, and in her chapter she talks about her work with skills students in which she invited them to reflect on the role of translation in their lives. So they started by reading a piece by Gloria Anzaldúa, the uh, Chicana feminist theorist, um, who talks about her bilingual identity and uh, the struggle that that has presented to her in kind of challenging raciolinguistic ideologies. Um, so here's one student's response um, in a kind of journal writing, and this is a student that Katie calls Lucy. So Lucy writes, I've always known that Chicano Spanish was known as a bastard language, and it's made me feel bad for knowing and speaking it. No one in my life speaks Spaniard Spanish, so when I was taught that in my Spanish classes, I would get upset because I would interrupt into my Spanish, and I would be told I was wrong. Same definition, same idea, different ways to say it, and I would be wrong. I didn't understand. So here Lucy invokes the common raciolinguistic ideology of Chicano English as bastardized or impure for many Latina and Latino students, Spanish classes can be sites of shame and marginalization as the Spanish they grew up speaking is systematically and publicly devalued. Again, it's rare for students to have the opportunity in school to critically re reflect on their past learning experiences and to reframe the racialized affects of humiliation around their racialized language use as a political issue. But this pain needs to be addressed as part of the project of sociolinguistic justice for these youth. So this goal takes us from racialized, this goal of sociolinguistic justice takes us from racialized affects to what my co-authors and I have called affective agency. And by that we mean the production of social action informed by and involving embodied emotional encounter with the world. And uh, we've written this up. Uh, so this is uh, Sebastian Ferrara and Megan Correa, uh, my co-authors. Um, in a paper that I have very recently learned, uh, thanks to the editor, uh, will be forthcoming in the Journal of Language Identity and Education. Um, and my next example uh, comes from Audrey Lopez's chapter in Feeling It, and this is my only usable photo of Audrey. It's clearly not taken in an, from an academic context, uh, but you can see she's kind of fun, um, and uh, so I guess it's appropriate for talking about affect. Uh, so Audrey was very interested in exploring the issue of youth language brokering with the skills students. Um, and this is a very widespread uh, kind of issue. And in previous research on this topic, there's been a lot of attention to the affective experience of youth who act as language brokers for their parents and other adults. Um, so Audrey and uh, her co-instructor Sulema uh, discovered exactly this issue when they led a discussion about this topic in their classroom. So during the discussion, Audrey and Suleyma noticed that the students expressed a range of affects about language brokering, ranging from I feel happy when I do it, to I feel proud, to I feel annoyed, I feel stressed out. So in a subsequent class, Audrey and Suleyma decided to address this emotional discussion. Um, so they wrote these phrases on whiteboards around the classroom. So the one in the background here says I feel proud. 
and they invited students to d discuss how each of them felt about their own experiences with language brokering. So one student, whom we call Elisa, and she is right here, um, describes her work as a youth interpreter. This is pretty unusual. She was actually, um, kind of, as a volunteer youth interpreter for Spanish dominant parents whose children attend local schools, and this was a program of the schools until they took it away from the students. Uh, that's another controversy I'd be happy to talk about later. Oops, that didn't work. They're like last time I played with like a first grade class. Oh. And there's, there's like parents that don't speak English, and I'm able to like translate and interpret whatever the teacher is saying so that they could get like the message and get more involved in their students' education. Because without, I feel like without me, that wouldn't be possible. So I'm like really happy that I'm able to help these kids out because you don't know what their teachers can be like. So You're making like crazy. <laughs> so in this interaction and in this classroom, not only do the instructors create sp space for Elisa and other students to reflect on their affective experience of language brokering, but they themselves also explicitly valorize and model emotion as a basis for knowledge, understanding, and learning. Um, so Sulema says, you're making my heart sing, I'm so happy, Audrey kind of exclaims emotionally. Um, so the classroom here is constituted as a space where not only students but also instructors can express emotion in ways that are positioned as central, not marginal, to the learning process or disruptive of the process, which students have also encountered a lot. Moreover, this valorization of students' affective experiences had consequences beyond the classroom. With the support and encouragement of Audrey and Sulema, later in the semester, Elisa initiated a one-student activist campaign to change her school's English-only graduation policy. She'd been selected as a graduation speaker, and inspired by the skills program's focus on linguistic inclusiveness, she submitted her speech in Spanish. When school personnel told her that she would have to give the speech in English, Elisa argued that this policy would prevent her family from understanding what she was saying at one of the proudest moments of her and their lives. In the end, Elisa persuaded the administration to change the policy, she gave the speech in Spanish, and the English translation that she herself provided was printed in the program. Her activism and the effective agency and linguistic expertise that moved her to action thus successfully challenged institutionalized linguistic discrimination at her own school. And this is a photo uh, from the ceremony, although Elisa isn't pictured here. The final way that we can work towards sociolinguistic justice with youth is to create partnerships with them to move beyond school as usual as much as possible and to learn from each other as much as possible rather than a one-way transfer of knowledge. So here I offer an example of a collaboration that the skills program has had for the past couple of years with a local community organization that serves Mexican indigenous immigrant families who are extremely marginalized racially, economically, and linguistically. The youth group of this organization, um, by the time we began our partnership with them, was already focused on its own agenda of challenging sociolinguistic injustices in their lives. This included a campaign against bullying, uh, racist bullying, in local schools directed at indigenous students, and the lack of interpreters for their Muztec and Zapotec speaking parents in local schools. By providing the students with linguistic training, uh, especially kind of technical linguistic training, skills help them to achieve their goal of developing literacy materials in yet, as yet unwritten varieties of their home languages. So uh, this is a po an example of uh, what resulted from this partnership. This is a trilingual literacy poster in Mistec, Zapotec, and Spanish, designed and created by these students. Um, so these are you know, kids between 14, 15, 16 years old using um, the IPA, including, including tone analysis. They did acoustic analysis with PROT uh, because these are tone languages that they speak. Um, so this is just the beginning of a larger project of uh, creating triliteracy materials for their community. Um, finally, um, let me just add a few brief caveats about what I've said and then wrap up. So there are obviously limitations to any sort of special program for youth precisely because these programs exist alongside the institutional structure of schooling rather than directly challenging that structure. In addition, there are specific limits to the skills program and to my own involvement in it. 
First, there's the obvious limitation of my racial position within whiteness, which limits what I'm able to see, hear, and understand. And everything I've been talking about has come out of a lot of dialogue with uh, my colleagues, my graduate students, my undergraduates, and the skills student researcher activists themselves. Racially and disciplinarily diverse research teams are therefore crucial to this kind of work. Second, there's much more we can do to move beyond school as usual and society as usual, and to create more truly youth-led partnerships. And one way that we're trying to do this currently um, is with the Mistec and Zapotec youth by working with them to create um, and conduct a multilingual community language survey where they'll be using their own multilingual expertise to conduct this survey. Uh, this is the first time uh, this has been done in their community, and the information it will provide is vitally important to them and their families. So in conclusion, there's an urgent need for social justice-centered, youth-oriented research on language and race, not just in Santa Barbara or in California, but in every racist city, state, and nation in the world, in other words, everywhere. But it does appear that the current situation in the United States is especially egregious, so that's where I'm focusing my own work. Finally, if we as researchers and educators in applied linguistics are to advance the goal of sociolinguistic justice, then race, racism, and raciolinguistic ideologies must be at the center of our work, because whether we acknowledge it or not, racializing processes are at the center of our lives and of the lives of our students, our research participants, and the members of our communities. So I want to thank our sponsors, um, the many skills team members, past, present, and future, and all of you for your attention, and I hope comments and questions later. Thank you.